the kind of intellectual dissatisfaction that motivates philosophy isn't like factual curiosity about the world, but it's something more like um, a certain sense that your own conceptual house needs reconstitution, that it's out of order. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 165. And this episode is with my friend Anubhav Vasudevan, who is associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Chicago, where he works in formal epistemology and the history of logic and the foundations of probability and all sorts of things, though he's published in a number of other areas besides these all sorts of things that I've just listed already. And this is Anubhav's second appearance on the show. In episode 81, he and I talked about mathematics, physics, and the history of logic, as well as what it was like for both of us studying with the absolute legend Heim Gaifman, uh, who is our mutual uh, teacher and, and mentor at Columbia University in New York, and who I just talked to a couple days ago and he's doing swell. And one caveat I have to mention right off the bat for this episode is that Anubhav and I had been planning on discussing the foundations of probability, but then our conversation went in a very different direction that we weren't really prepared for, that we do talk about the problem of the single trial. But anyway, this this uh, strange direction that we went in was the very, very, very bizarre metaphysics of Charles Saunders' purse. But hopefully you find this as interesting as I do because he's a, he's a huge figure, figure uh, in philosophy, but his metaphysics, which is quite wacky but so cool, is not often discussed. Maybe for some good reasons, as, as you'll hear, but... As Anubhav argues, there are a lot of very important insights in his metaphysics as well. And then another caveat I, caveat I want to register is that, oh, that's, that's something. So when I was in undergrad, I had a professor that kept saying caveat. And I thought, does he not know how to pronounce words? Because it's caveat. And then I learned it was caveat. And... I was talking to my therapist the other day and he kept saying, he wasn't telling me to do this, but he kept on saying cease and desist. And I had never heard this in my life. And I said, why are you pronouncing it desist? It's desist. And he told me I was wrong and I argued with him about it for a while. And then I looked it up and the word is indeed, according to dictionaries, pronounced desist. But then I asked, okay, granted, I only asked two people that I know, but they all said, when I said, fill in this word, cease and, they they both said desist. So I'm wondering if it's a generational thing, but cease and desist just does not sound right to me. Okay, that uh, anecdote elaborated. Now, another caveat I wanted to register is that Toward the end, I speak a bit and rather incoherently about one of Zeno's paradoxes of motion called the, the stadium paradox that has to do with some puzzles that might arise if space is discrete. And if you want a better description of it, because I use my hands and it is just not really all that coherent if you're listening. Uh, if you want a better description, you should check out the entry on Zeno's Paradoxes of Motion that's available in the online Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. But now, uh, without any further ado, Anubhav will be back and we will talk about something other than the bizarre metaphysics of Charles Saunders Peirce. But for now, without any further ado... I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Anubhav. In our last episode, we we talked about 
two things. We talked about the relationship between math, physics, and philosophy. And then we got into some topics in ancient and maybe modern is the right word, logic. And since we already covered why you're interested in formal philosophy, I thought since it's, it's all going to come up again today, I should ask what it is about understanding the development of formal philosophy over time that you find so compelling. Because last time, like I said, we, we talked about Leibniz, we talked about the peripatetics, but you're also interested in Pierce and Boole and Schroeder and, and Frege and up to the contemporary time as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, some of this I, I probably brought up in our last conversation, but um, let's see. You know, I, I think that um, what I find really interesting, let's, I mean, the history of formal philosophy is a big topic, but let's, let's stick to the history of logic for a second. Um, what I think is really interesting about the history of logic, say like prior to the 20th century um, is how different it is in like form and shape from the way that logic is like currently taught in, 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 in philosophy departments, but also in sort of mathematics departments, the shape of logic, um, changed so dramatically in the 20th century, sort of, largely as a result of its alliance with mathematics and the kind of, you know, the foundational sort of logicist program um, that was really, you know, prominent in the 20th century. And there were all these important logical results related to that program. It, it, it has given a whole, it's given a certain feeling to what logic is that I think is like sort of accepted as standard orthodoxy amongst you know, students of contemporary philosophy, contemporary analytic philosophy. Um, what, what's interesting when you go back and look at the way that logic was discussed and treated and thought about by philosophers prior to the 20th century, it just has a very different feel. It's um, it's more closely allied to topics in metaphysics. It's more closely allied to a variety of issues in the philosophy of mind. Um, uh, it, it, if it's less technical, you know, that might be owing to the fact that um, that uh, a lot of like contemporary mathematical notation was sort of late to develop in the history of, of modern thought, but um, you know it's much more closely allied to to these kind of bigger philosophical issues in uh, what I would call sort of metaphysics, if you will, uh, and less with like specific topical issues in in, in mathematics. And it, it's also kind of I, I feel like you know the history of logic is in a way uh, it's sort of richer from a kind of psychological point of view. Because the kind of the target of logical reflection for these older philosophers wasn't just a, the specific kind of reasoning that goes on in mathematics. It was kind of reasoning much more broadly construed, right? Reasoning as a method of argumentation, reasoning as a method of discovering truth. It wasn't just like mathematical reasoning and more specifically mathematical proof, right? And one thing about mathematics that, you know, is sometimes it's easy to overlook is that you know from a kind of psychological point of view, mathematical reasoning is really kind of simplistic. There, there aren't a lot of like complex attitudes that one has to adopt towards propositions in the course of mathematical reasoning. You know, you more or less like uh, adopt an attitude that uh, that that. Uh, indicate something like assertion of a proposition. Maybe there's a kind of hypothetical assertion that's involved in certain kinds of proofs where you suppose a certain thing to be true for the sake of giving some demonstration, but that's about it, right? You know, uh, none of the more subtle kind of psychological attitudes that we have to adopt in the course of reasoning really arise in the context of mathematics. And so in that sense, it's a really degenerate mode of <laughs> reasoning. And, and so, to, you know, to sort of, to focus all of our study of logic on that particular kind of reasoning, I think, omits just a, a huge variety of, of like interesting and, and psychologically complex modes of inference uh, from the story. And so when you go back and look at the way that philosophers thought about logic uh, prior to the 20th century, prior to this kind of alliance between logic and these foundational projects in uh, the philosophy of mathematics, you just see that it's kind of, it's psychologically much richer. Um, it engages more directly with topics in 
the philosophy of mind and also in the to you know, topics, topics in metaphysics. And so for, for that reason, I, I kind of, I find the history of the subject really, really fascinating. When you said it differs, it's different in form and shape from how it is now. The first thing I think of is the begriff shrift, which is the beginning of sort of mathematical or close to the beginning of mathematical logic, but the shape and form on the page is quite alien compared to what goes on in a, a present or a, a contemporary mathematical textbook. But I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar with ancient or medieval logic the way that you are. Where the when you say that the shape was different, do you mean that quite literally in the way that the griff shrift is different? Their notation was just wild. Yeah, I mean, then, the, yeah, the notation of the progression was. Well. I didn't, I didn't mean it quite so literally, but it is true that the shape of the, of, of the logics is actually quite different. Uh, what I meant more is that you know, if you so if you study ancient logic, one of the things you discover is that um, you know the idea of right reasoning that is meant to be the subject matter of this inquiry, right, of logic, is kind of it, it's sort of clumsily mixed up with a bunch of other notions that in our contemporary way of seeing the subject, we would be careful to distinguish, right? So we distinguish, for instance, you know, a valid argument, let's say, from um, a convincing argument, right? One which is psychologically convincing, let's say, um, uh, to, the, to the person to whom the argument is presented. We distinguish um, uh, a valid argument from um, uh, a, a, an explanatory argument. Right, an argument that provides us some kind of explanatory insight into the conclusion. Right, um, all of these things are kind of like in 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 the contemporary approach to logic. All of these things are sort of like separated out carefully and sort of set aside for the purposes of like the study of logic proper. Right, which is the study of sort of deductively valid reasoning, something like that. Where in you know because in mathematics, really, that's that's like what matters. Right, what matters is whether the proof is a proof. Um, but if you look at ancient logic, you see that all these notions are much more sort of clumsily mixed together, you know? So, you know, Aristotle, for instance, has it built into his logic that um, an argument shouldn't be circular. That is the conclusion shouldn't appear among the premises, right? If you think about like modern logical systems, most, you know, when we teach logic, let's say to undergrads in an intro to logic course, the first systems of logic that they're introduced to are systems which happily admit valid circular arguments. In fact, it's a kind of trivially valid argument that includes the conclusion among the premises, right? Because insofar as semantic validity is what we're concerned with, if all the premises are true, the conclusion is true as well. And so having the conclusion among the premises makes the argument sort of trivially valid, maybe uninterestingly valid, but valid nonetheless, right? And so for Aristotle, of course, it was a bad argument. It's a bad argument that includes the conclusion among the premises <laughs> because it doesn't explain anything. It doesn't, it doesn't show you anything. It doesn't teach you anything new. So all of these ideas of like, you know, uh, uh, of, of instructing someone as to what, uh, as to why the conclusion holds, let's say, explaining to them why the conclusion holds, that's all part of logic. It falls within the province of logic and the systems of logic that, well, the system of logic that say Aristotle was building was meant to incorporate those features. It actually becomes kind of tricky from a, from a kind of technical point of view <laughs> to have systems of logic, which have all of these features. It, it's not so easy, for instance, to, to build a system of logic, which uh, that, that kind of is, is, is smooth from a technical point of view, but also doesn't have the property that a good argument allows for the conclusion to appear among the premises, or a good argument is one which allows for the premises to occur more than once, right? Like, so Aristotle also thinks it's, you know, it would be silly for the same premise to occur twice. <laughs> in an argument, right? So you have to build that into the system and it becomes kind of a technical challenge to do that. But it's all, you know, that's all part of logic. So, you know, these distinctions between logic and the theory of explanation and even rhetoric, you know, what makes an argument convincing to a person, these are much more blurry um, uh, in the ancients than they are in, in our contemporary approach to the subject. Hmm. It's interesting to think that I mean, in today today's logic in a textbook or a math logic class, there's no prescriptive component at all. You, it doesn't. There's nothing that tells you how you ought to reason. But as you just mentioned, with rhetoric, um, other 
dimensions of ancient logic, there is very much this component of teaching how to be a good thinker that's missing. Yeah, I mean, of course, in a way, there would be something <laughs> there'd be something strange about taking that topic, say the topic of how to sort of reason well to be a good thinker, um, even just within the, the domain of philosophy and sort of call that logic and teach it as its, as its own separate subject, you know? Like this is what's funny, well, it's, it's a funny thing about philosophy's relationship to logic, right? We teach logic as a separate standalone course with its own subject matter, right? You don't see that in other departments and other disciplines, right? It's just in philosophy that we teach this course called logic and that we present it as a kind of prerequisite to a person's, at least an introductory level logic is kind of prerequisite to a person's philosophical education. But if logic just means sort of like, you know, reasoning well, like presumably logicality is a virtue, is an intellectual virtue, not just for the philosopher, but for the historian, for the statistician, for the mathematician, right? But in all of those other disciplines, the way that that conception of logic is taught to students is just by doing the thing itself. You know, you learn what a good historical argument or what a valid mode of historical inference is, not by studying like a course in historical logic or something, but by like doing logic, studying, you know, by, by, by engaging in the activity of history, right? In a scholarly way. And you, and you learn it that way. S similarly in mathematics, and mathematics is a case in point because there, like the reasoning is almost constitutive of the activity. So you would think that they would really, it'd be important to teach them, like, what is a proof? What is a good argument? But you don't teach mathematics students like what a proof is. Um, they figure it out by doing mathematics, right? And um, we do too. The reason, so in philosophy, if, if, if we're interested in teaching people to reason well, you know, as philosophers, I think the best way to do it is just to have them do philosophy, right? To expose them to the, to the thinking and the writing of great philosophers and see what it is that they're doing and sort of learn by doing. The reason we as philosophers have this like separate subject that we call logic that we study is, I think it's partly for the reasons that we were talking about in our last conversation, which is that philosophers care about reasoning, not just as something that we aspire to do well, but we care about reasoning and arguments because it's often kind of subtly fallacious reasoning that reveals to us that there's some interesting philosophical work to be done. Um, you know, it's, it's part of what we're like, it's like the object of our reflection and not just the method by which it's carried out. And so, you know, for that reason, it has this kind of special place in, in philosophy. Hmm. I, I think it's kind of strange though. I, I like, I feel like a standard mathematical logic, logic course, so set theory, model theory, the basics of first order and predicate logic, and that would be much more at home in a math or a computer science department, whereas what isn't taught in most philosophy departments these days, uh, modus ponens, the, the different fallacies, uh, inverse, obverse, all of these sorts of things that were part of older logics they were part of would be logic. quite relevant in today's philosophy departments yeah i mean i think there is something i mean there's something like charming about those like scholastic logic textbooks <laughs> that are basically taught to sort of like students in like elementary school or like early middle school or something and you, they teach you these you know 15 modes of reasoning and if you master these 15 modes of reasoning then you master the art of rhetoric and you know it's it's kind of a in a way it's it's sort of charming it, but it's also sort of you know it's charmingly naive in a way because it suggests that somehow logic is like an easy thing to learn logic in that sense the sen in the sense of reasoning well whereas in fact it's a very complicated and subtle art that takes uh, you know, quite a lot of practice and skill and careful work to master. And so, you know, it, in that sense, I think we could try to teach something like that in, in, a, in a philosophy department, of course, in like sort of critical philosophical thinking or method. I think it would be difficult. I think, you know, I think the best way to teach that kind of logic is to sit down with uh, good philosophical texts and read them and think about them, right? And sort of uh, in the act of thinking about them, you learn something about how to reason well as a, as a philosopher. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think I mentioned when I was listing some of the logicians that you're interested in, 
Purse's name, but Charles Sanders Purse, he, he's come up on the show, his name at least has been invoked many times, but his work, I think it only came up in an episode with Gabe Greenberg of UCLA where we were talking about icons and symbols. And his, what was his the semiotics. third one? Indexicals? Icons, indexes, and symbols. Indices and symbols. Indices, yeah. And I, I know that Purse is a particularly important figure for you, though not just because of algebraic logic, his role in early algebraic logic. But before we get into his work, just who was he? When was he around? Um, when was he around? So he was, you know, so he was a, uh, so he was an American philosopher, one of the sort of triad of American pragmatist philosophers, along with William James and John Dewey. So those are the three figures who are kind of associated with the movement in philosophy that's called American pragmatism. Um, most of his, uh, so most of his, uh, work was produced, I would say between, 1870 and 1910. Um, they're sort of different stages in his writing. So if you look at his writings from like the 1870s, they tend to be mostly technical writings when he's developed, as you mentioned, he's developed, he's like sort of advancing um, algebraic logic beyond, um, uh, beyond the state at which it had been developed by George Boole 20 years earlier, um, expanding it to in include um, uh, sort of his great real achievement was um, to sort of expand Boole's logic beyond um, simple monadic predicates to encompass um, two place relations and three place relations as well. So he developed a logic of an algebraic logic of relations, which is vital to today's mathematics. It's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not quite so. The system that he developed in the 1870s, it is it's it's now known to be equivalent to um, a certain fragment of first order quantificational logic. It's not exactly as strong as first order quantificational logic, um, but it's uh, it's equivalent to first order quantificational logic with two variables. So it's it's a it's a it's a it's a large fragment of, of first order logic. Um, interestingly enough, Peirce himself uh, in the 1880s. Um, sort of pivoted away from the algebraic approach towards a quantificational approach to logic. And he developed a system of quantificational logic, which uh, we now know to be equivalent to first order quantificational predicate logic. And in fact, um, our, the, the kind of notation that we use uh, when, we, uh, when we teach, say, uh, quantifier logic to students, like predicate logic to students, is Peirce's notation, it's not Frege's. So the, the, the backwards E for the existential quantifier and the upside down A for the universal quantifier. So those are, those are, that's Peirce's notation. Oh, really? Huh. Um, yeah. Um, and so uh, it's interesting. So he was really doing sort of logic in a very like state of the art way. He was, he, you know, he's a very interesting and tragic figure. I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to get too much into his biography because um, uh, it would just, it would just take up too much of our time. But, <laughs> but now for, that you for, said for, he's tragic, I've got to hear. Uh, well, so he he grew up in um he was sort of raised in this intellectual environment that was probably about as um as kind of purely academic an environment as like one can imagine so he was he was raised in sort of cambridge his father benjamin purse cambridge like, massachusetts cambridge massachusetts sorry his father so he was a, a kind of a child of harvard so to speak um Although his relationship with the university is very fraught, but his father Benjamin Peirce was um, was uh, a really well known and um, you know quite preeminent mathematician, probably America's best mathematician at the time. Um, and so Peirce was surrounded by, like as a child, he was surrounded by like all of these intellectuals who were. So at the time, Cambridge was a very rich place because they were basically living off of this. This was the time when, when um, you know, the center of commerce in America hadn't yet moved to Wall Street. It was State Street or whatever I think it is in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the time. So these were all the people who were kind of living fat off of the money that had been made in the East India trade. And so they had nothing to do. They had lots of money and they had nothing to do but sit around and kind of like – 
speculate and theorize and, and be intellectuals. They were academics in like a real sense of the term. And so Peirce grew up in that environment in a very like kind of thick academic environment, a very thick academic setting surrounded by people who are kind of um, uh, 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 really deeply intellectual in their orientation. And so uh, he grew up in that environment. Um, he was a bit of a kind of savant in his own way. He was very gifted in mathematics, especially in logic. He had a lot of very interesting insights early on. He was, he was really um, a sort of early student of philosophy. He read uh, Kant at a very early age. It had a very deep impact on him. Um, he thought about Kant in kind of philosopher's terms. So he understood all the Kantian jargon. <laughs> he was kind of a, a traditional philosopher in that sense of the term. He, he was familiar with the various traditions in philosophy that were being discussed and debated. He knew um, all of the major works in like the German idealist tradition. He was like deeply kind of invested in all of that stuff. At the same time, he was also, um, he had his feet in the world of uh, what was then sort of hard experimental science. So he spent most of his career not working as a philosopher in an academic program, although that would have been his dream, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but for various reasons, he wasn't he wasn't allowed to hold positions like that. But he spent most of his career working for the US um, Coastal Survey, I think. Uh, and basically, it, it, this was like hard science, right? They were basically he was a scientist, and he 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 made some important contributions to um, the theory of like pendular motion, right? He he basically argued that all of the pendula that were being used to measure um, positions were subject to a certain systematic error that needed to be corrected, right? And he worked out this. Um, uh, he worked out this whole account of the errors that were uh, that were present in all these pendular measurements, and he uh, figured out a way to kind of correct for those errors in a kind of systematic way. It was very like you know, it's very like boots on the ground, non-theoretical, empirical experimental science. And he spent a lot of his time doing that, although um, he really wasn't well suited for the work because it was like very detail oriented. It was very meticulous. And he was a bit of a, um, uh, how do I put it? He was a bit of um, an intellectual wanderer. <laughs> His mind went to all sorts of different places and he wrote about all sorts of different things. And so he had a lot of difficulty like holding that job. Um, he also had a really, uh, as far as reports go, he had a really like irascible personality, like a, a really irascible temperament. Um, he was disliked by a lot of people, um, like personally disliked for a variety of reasons. He was regarded as a very difficult personality to deal with. Um, he, uh, so, some people think it was in part owing to the fact that um, that he suffered from a kind of debilitating case of uh, of facial neuralgia. So what would happen is his face would he would undergo these kind of like paralytic uh, experiences where his face would just like freeze up and it would cause him a great deal. Uh, uh, he would be in excruciating pain during this time. And so to medicate himself, he used all sorts of drugs and he sort of became addicted to many of the drugs that he was using largely like to medicate himself. Um, and that compounded his like personal difficulties with people. He was also somebody who wasn't, how do I put it? He wasn't um, particularly moved by like, uh, the contemporary moral strictures of his day. <laughs> he lived a kind of, he lived a kind of like extra, not extravagant life, but he lived a kind of like what would be regarded as a sort of morally borderline sketchy life, let's say. He was a, ba a debaucherous guy. He was, he was. And so he had a lot of difficulty securing permanent academic positions, um, even though he was, you know, in his own way, a quite famous figure, you know. So like <sighs> William James and, and, and uh, John Dewey were both um, students of his. They attended lectures that he gave. Um, and uh, William James was actually a close friend of his and tried to sort of petition on his behalf to get him an appointment at a university. And um, it, he just, it just wouldn't, it couldn't happen because the, the higher ups in the administration just vetoed it. Um, and so he never ended up holding any um, permanent academic position 
um, he gave a series, he did, he did manage to hold a kind of temporary academic position at Johns Hopkins when it, when it first started up its graduate program, um, where he, um, he taught logic and there's, uh, a collection of lectures that he delivered along with published articles by students who worked with him in that period of time that's available. And that is really like incredible. So the work that they produced in that period of time is really like remarkable, but he was never able to secure a permanent academic position, um, which is a real shame. And so he ended up, you know, he ended up dying pretty much broke and living off of the charity of a few of his kind of patrons who, you know, kept him going. <laughs> um, you know, he had a lot of like failed business ventures and like things that he tried that never like worked out. And so, you know, what's, what's really disappointing uh, when I say tragic, what's, what's really disappointing is that um, when he, when he, when he died, I guess this was in, I'm sorry, I'm going to mess the year up. It's sometime around sometime between 1910 and 1915. I don't know when he died um, all of his papers. And he, he was one of these people who wrote voluminously. So, you know, his collected works, which are now being put together, are probably going to, you know, exceed something like thirty volumes <laughs> when when they're all when they're all put out. Um, so he has these. He, he all of his collected papers were um, were kept um, sort of under lock and key at Harvard, um, but for a, a variety of really unfortunate reasons, um, they were never open to the public. And it was like fifty years later that um, some of his like former students managed to get the papers released. So, you know, for like half a century, we were deprived of all of this like incredible scholarship. And it was because of, you know, it's because of like the prudishness of American academia. It's because they were afraid that some of his letters would reveal, I don't know, personal things that Harvard didn't want to be associated with. It's a, It's one of like, you know, it's a real... It's 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 one of these like it it highlights you know what's what can what can go so terribly wrong <laughs> with these academic institutions, right? That they can be like so so conservative in their in their attitude towards these things. It was a real I mean it's it's a real tragedy from from the point of view of like American philosophy because we we lost this person's work who was probably to my mind at least one of the most original philosophers uh, of all time. Um, certainly one of the most original American philosophers. Uh, and we just didn't have access to his work for 50 years because, you know, the prudes at Harvard didn't want us to be offended by something that would come up in one of his letters or something. It's just a shame. Anyway, I mean, there's more on his life. I mean, he hasn't actually been proper, in my opinion, he hasn't actually been properly biographized. So like, uh, there aren't, there aren't biographies that one can read of him, I think, that are as carefully, I mean, there are a few um, that are, that are okay, but um uh, but I, I don't think there's like a definitive biography of Peirce. It's, it's still waiting to be written. Partly it's because, no, no, definitely. partly because his work is so difficult to digest. I mean, it, he's not an easy philosopher to read, you know? Um, and he's, in fact, he's making up new words every, every, yeah, period. he's a philosopher's, you know, he's, he's, what's funny is like what most people know Peirce for, um, is a series of essays that he wrote, uh, on the methodology of science, right? So these are famous papers that people will often read in courses on pragmatism or even courses on the philosophy of science. And, you know, they always begin with this famous paper called The Fixation of Belief. That's the first paper in the series. And then they move on to the second paper, which is called How to Make Our Ideas Clear. And it's in that paper that Peirce famously introduces what um, William James later describes as like the pragmatic maxim for meaning. This is the way that meaning is to be determined, right? By considering what its observable outcomes are. Um, and so he introduces that as part of his like series of essays on the methodology of science. People usually stop after reading those first two essays, but actually the rest of the essays get really interesting because the, the third essay is on probability. Uh, I think it's called the doctrine of chances. Um, the fourth essay is um, uh, a theory of statistics, a general theory of probable inference, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, that's a paper in which Peirce introduces for the first time, uh, the notion of a p-value in statistics um, never been discussed before. And he, it's really a p-value. He like he computes them, he presents them as part of his theory of statistical inference. And this is like years before Neyman and Pearson came along. And you know, 
presented all this stuff in, in kind of systematic fashion. And so it's like, it, it's just, it's really remarkable stuff. But those essays on the methodology of science, which people kind of do associate with Peirce, um, <laughs> they were papers that Peirce wrote only because he was completely broke and he needed money. And uh, the publisher of this journal on popular science or something asked him if he would be willing to write a series on the, <laughs> on the methodology of science. And so he agreed. And so he published these papers, which I'm sure for that venue, whatever the venue, it's like a, it was like popular science, right? I'm sure for that venue, these papers were like way too philosophical, <laughs> probably for the intended audience, but they, they really are person is like least technical. Um, their person is like, this is where person is really trying to be accessible. Later on, when he was afforded like sort of more license to write philosophy in the form that he wanted to write it in, the philosophy becomes much more esoteric. It becomes much more like technical and jargon filled. And you see that he really is like, he's a philosopher in that sense of the term. <laughs> and he's a systematic architectonic philosopher in that sense of the term where, you know, he feels like all the terminology is wrong and we just have to reintroduce it from scratch. Um, so yeah, so there's that, you know, there's that part of his corpus that people read. The other part of his corpus that has become really popular is, um, his work on semiotics, uh, the theory of signs. Um, that's popular, uh, among linguists, uh, now. Um, I think it's, it, it, it was popular for a while among sort of, um, analytic anthropologists. Um, they really like a lot of Peirce's work. And so, so Peirce has become popular in those, in those crowds. Um, I think his, you know, he hasn't fully been, um, he hasn't fully been revived in mainstream academic philosophy. And so that's something that we're still waiting for, but, um, he will be eventually the work is original enough that it'll stand the test of time. And he, he does in fact develop, like he has a, he has a system of philosophy, which is interestingly and importantly different from other systems of philosophy that we study, um, So, um, yeah, so that's, that's Peirce. I mean, I got into Peirce myself, not so much by reading his philosophy. I only came to that sort of later because it's, it's just like more obscure. It's less, it's less accessible. I came to Peirce mostly by, uh, by way of his writings on probability, because I, I think Peirce is like, to my mind, at least he, he's one of the, he's one of the few philosophers who like, you know, he really takes seriously some of the conceptual problems that surround the notion of probability itself. So he raises these very deep and difficult problems that I think we still don't have very satisfactory answers to concerning the nature of probability. Um, and it was just very intriguing to read that stuff because so, so many people take probability just to be kind of a, a notion that we've sort of worked out in one way or another. And, uh, you know, Peirce was pointing to sort of very deep conceptual difficulties with the concept. You know, so one of the one of the famous problems that Peirce poses, I think this is in his paper uh, entitled "On the Doctrine of Chances." I might be misplacing it, but I think it's in that paper on the Doctrine of Chances. Is this so-called problem of the single trial? I don't know if you ever heard of this problem. Probably in some variety, you've heard of it. So the the version that Peirce presents to the reader in that paper is um, is as follows. It's like so imagine a deck of cards, okay? So we have like 50 cards in the deck, maybe 100 cards in the deck. All the cards in the deck are red, except for one, which is black. Okay, so the deck is shuffled, and the top card, say, from the deck is, is selected and laid face down on the table. Now, God comes to you, and he says, here's the deal, okay? You're going to guess the color of this card. And then we're going to flip it over. If the card is red, or sorry, if the card is the color that you guess, right? Sorry, the card is the color that you guess, then you'll be awarded eternal felicity and bliss. I'll transport you to heaven and forevermore, right? Does um, he say eternal felicity? He, he probably does. It's, so, it's something akin to that. He's, he's quite a poetic writer, so he probably says something like that. Um, uh, if, you pick, if, you, if you pick the color and it turns out to be, if you pick a color and it turns out to be wrong, then you will suffer eternal damnation forevermore, right? Those are the stakes, okay? It's a one-off thing. We're not gonna play this game over and over again, right? After the game is played, the deck and maybe the entire world for all we know will be like disintegrated. And all that will be left is you either 
enjoying the fruits of your correct choice, right? And experiencing this eternal felicity or you suffering eternal damage. That's all. That's it, right? Nothing more. So Peirce says, look, what should you pick? So this is the problem. <laughs> this is the problem that Peirce raises, right? He's like, okay, so what should you pick? Like immediately the mind like jumps to the conclusion that we ought to pick red here because the preponderance of cards in the deck are red, right? Maybe 99 out of 100 cards in the deck are, it doesn't really matter. You can make it 999 out of 1,000 are red, right? So it, it's very natural to say the rational thing to do in this case is to pick red, right? But it's a one-shot thing, as Peirce points out. So what if it so happens that you pick red and you're rational for whatever reason, you know, you claim, you claim to be rational in your choice, and it turns out that the card is black, right? It's the one card in the deck that's black. So what's your consolation here, <laughs> right? What does that show you other than that, like rationality was a terrible thing to exercise on this occasion, right? So, you know, we have this kind of, we have this kind of like intuitive judgment that the probability is higher of that card being red than of that card being black. The question the person wants to interrogate by raising this kind of thought experiment is how does that judgment, let's assume that it's correct, get connected up with a decision as to what is rational in this case, right? Knowing that this is a one-off case, right? And of course, it's not just the, the problem of the single trial is actually the problem of finite trials because, you know, as Peirce points out, like all the probability tells you is something about the limiting behavior of say repeated draws from the deck. In any finite sample, you could get any crazy thing. It's consistent with whatever, like, you know, whatever the probabilities might be. And so how do we attach, so to speak, <laughs> this judgment of probability to a rational decision in this case as to what we ought to do? How do we translate, right, between the, let's say, descriptive claim that the card is much more likely to be red than it is to be black and the normative claim that in this particular circumstance where I'm given this one shot, I ought to pick red? Right. That's the problem with the single trial. It's sort of how do we affect that translation? What are the, what are the, what are the assumptions needed to affect that translation? Um, and Purse's, you know, it's a very deep problem, actually. You know, it, it sounds sort of simplistic and, uh, but, but it's a, it's a, it's a really deep problem. You know, it, it's not a problem so much for probability theory as it is a problem for why we should think that these facts about probability should play such an important role in the rational decision-making of a finite agent, right? Um, knowing that at the end of the day, those probabilities don't actually constrain the behavior in any kind of real way, right, of a finite sample. So all the experiences of cards and dice that you're ever gonna get in your life, right, it's perfectly consistent with dice being fair, that you're just gonna have bad luck <laughs> and end up broke, you know? And in that case, like, what have the probabilities done for you other than end you up broke, right? That's, that's the thought. And so, so Peirce's kind of provocative, ultimately I think it has to be wrong, but his provocative solution to the problem is to say that what bridges the gap between these claims about probability and the normative claims about what an agent ought to do, a finite agent ought to do, are certain kind of ethical convictions, if you will, on the part of the agent. Um, basically, you sort of have to believe that in in choosing the red option in this particular case, that you're even if you yourself um, are only going to be affected by the outcome of this particular draw, you sort of have to conceptualize yourself as part of a much larger enterprise. You have to see yourself as like part of a a society of people, a group of people who are going to be continuing to try these things out ad infinitum. You have to have faith. As Perspot said, <laughs> you have to have faith that like the human project is something which is going to continue ad infinitum. And you have to participate in that human project. You have to see yourself when you make these decisions based on probability as participating in that much larger human project. Um, that's, that's the only way for Perse that like probabilities have any kind of normative significance. They have normative significance only for agents who are involved in this collective activity. Um, of trying to figure things out about the world, making mistakes and correcting those mistakes and gradually over time sort of approximating towards the right answer in the long run. Um, 
But if you don't see yourself as, as part of that activity, then person thinks none of this makes any, like from a rational point of view, there is no such thing as probabilistic rationality for a selfish agent. Uh, if you're if you're a genuinely selfish agent who doesn't see yourself as part of this broader um, this broader program, then there's no meaningful sense in which um, probabilities constrain your your rational decision making. I think ultimately that must be wrong, but I think it's a really interesting. It shows the depth of the problem, right? That somebody as smart as Peirce would be led to that kind of conclusion. Um, and so uh, yeah, so I mean he has a lot of interesting things to say about about um, probability. Um, He's also one of the, uh, I think, few philosophers who um, argues against um, what you might think of as a kind of like Bayesian approach to probability, where probabilities are interpreted in subjective or epistemic terms. Um, he argues against that view, um, and so he's, you know, he's, his views on probability are like, uh, you know, really interesting. So that's probably how I got into Peirce at first. Um, but then once you uh, scratch the surface and you start discovering, um, you know, this, this, this really rich corpus of philosophical work, it's hard not to get pulled in deeper. Mm. Well, we've opened up a lot of different directions. I know that Tychism is his more metaphysical philosophy of chance and we'll get there. And then these are just a stream of thoughts right now, but given how tragic his life is. I'll be curious about how it was he managed to subscribe to agapism, which is another, or agapism. I don't know how, how to pronounce it, but another of his neologisms, I think. And then essays on the methodology of science. I'll be interested to hear how this background with the coastal survey and experimental science connects more impacts the connection between American pragmatism and science, but we'll get back to American pragmatism. And I know that his metaphysical views were quite idiosyncratic. I just mentioned agapism or yeah, agapism for instance. So his, his uh, view that love plays a fundamental role in, in the cosmos. And I, I doubt that you adhere to many of them. So just as you said that you thought his, his views ultimately on what uh, connects probability to rationality isn't correct. But this sort of gets back to that first question I asked about your interest in formal philosophy or the history of formal philosophy. Do people, so Leibniz, whoever it is, Peirce, is your interest in them more about, and I'm guessing this isn't the answer, uh, about their views, you, you adopt their views today, or is it more just a deep fascination with how other philosophers thought? Like you just said, even though Peirce was wrong about, you think Peirce was wrong about his approach to probability in this one question, it still points to the depth of the problem. So even if you don't agree with them, they're quite original and they had deep insights. Yeah. I mean, I tend to think, um, like, let me just make a very general point here. Uh, I tend to think agreement in philosophy isn't a particularly important thing. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, it, it sort of gets back a little bit to what we were discussing in our last conversation, where we talked about, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, where we talked about this idea that, um, that the kind of intellectual dissatisfaction that motivates philosophy isn't like factual curiosity about the world, but is something more like um, a certain sense that your own conceptual house needs reconstitution, that it's out of order, right? Yeah. So um, just taking that as a kind of jumping off point for a moment, I think the, the kind of corollary of that thought is that the ultimate aim of philosophy, let's say, insofar as it's understood as a response to that kind of intellectual dissatisfaction, isn't like properly described as like the discovery of truth. It's more like, um, well, <laughs> getting your own conceptual house in order, right? So what's the right way to, what's the right way to describe that kind of like success condition? 
um, taking for granted that this is indeed the kind of like intellectual dissatisfaction that, that, that spurns philosophical activity. I think the right way to think about it is that what philosophy aspires for is in some sense, like the creation of a coherent intellectual self, like what we're trying to do when we philosophize is we're trying to make ourselves into sort of coherent intellectual beings. Uh, we're trying to create for ourselves a kind of intellectual persona um, that is in its own way real, right? That has its own kind of being. And, um, you know, I, this is why, for instance, uh, you know, we do this not just selfishly, I probably just do it instinctively, but one of the things that happens when you create that sort of intellectual being is you provide others with a way of kind of knowing you that isn't otherwise available, right? So this is part of the, I, I think part of the appeal of, of like, of, of this kind of idea of philosophy is that like, like, let, let me just give you an example instead of just speaking abstractly. So like take a Kant, a figure like Kant, right? Kant has this whole systematic way of thinking about the world. Okay. Whether it's true or not, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's not an interesting question to ask, but what's, what's clear is that there is in fact a distinctive Kantian way of like seeing the world. It, it, that's why Kant is a figure for philosophers. The, the reason that the history of philosophy figures so prominently in our discipline and these figures like Aristotle, Kant, Leibniz, Peirce, the reason they figure so prominently for philosophers in a way that uh, equally important historical figures in science don't figure you know, prominently for like contemporary scientific practitioners is that what they give us are like ways of seeing the world that we can enter into and we can sort of participate in their ways of seeing the world and we can develop them and we can like tweak them and we can refine them and we can alter them and we can revise them. But they are definitely ways of thinking and seeing the world. And so they have a kind of intellectual reality. Kant has a kind of intellectual reality that Einstein doesn't, right? That's not to say that Kant's achievements were any greater than like the achievements of Einstein, but there is no, like, there are Kantians. There are people who have entered into that Kantian way of thinking about the world and subscribe to it in one way or another. They participate in that way of thinking about things and seeing the world. There are no Einsteinians. <laughs> I mean, there are people who accept the truth of the theory, perhaps, that he that he devised. But there's nobody who, I mean, except to the extent that he, there was a philosophy associated with him. He didn't, so I think to get back to the original question about the history of philosophy, part of what makes it so fascinating to me and part of why I like studying it um, is that you encounter these figures who have these, like they have these ways of seeing the world that are comprehensive and systematic enough, very idiosyncratic in, in, in some cases, but that are comprehensive and systematic enough that they, they create like sort of self-standing people that you can think about, right? And that you can kind of engage with and, and talk to and sort of, um, you know, you can, you can participate in their way of seeing things. And it's a very kind of like social activity in that respect. Like you kind of know Peirce, you know, I know Peirce, I know Leibniz in a way, because I, I, I sort of know the way that they, uh, that they think about the world. And so that's why I, from the point of view of like agreement or disagreement, it, it's not really that important. Like it's as important as like, you know, when you go around meeting people at a party or something, right. You're not judging like the quality of those interactions by like the extent to which you like agree with the person. Right. Sometimes you like people you don't disagree with. And sometimes like you want to spend time with people who are like very different than you in, in lots of ways. Right. And so I think in, in philosophy, there's a similar kind of experience that you have where it's like, you'll encounter somebody who you just find is like a fascinating person and you want to spend more time with them. You want to learn from them in that, in, in that way. Right. Not, not that you want them to teach you things about the world or something, but you just want to learn from them. You want to be with them. You want to, you want to have a relationship with them. Um, and so that's kind of how I, that's how I think about, you know, the history of philosophy, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. And so a, a lot of these figures are, are like, uh, they're just really interesting characters to me. Um, uh, and, and they, they do have a kind of like, you know, reality there's, a, you know, so for, for instance, with a figure like Leibniz, um, um, he has, he has such distinctive tendencies of thought. It, it's just sort of like, it makes him really, really interesting. Um, you know, so maybe I'll try to uh, get to Leibniz in a second through Peirce. So let me see what I want to say. Um, 
Okay, so so what's the right way? What's the right way to think about Peirce's metaphysics, if that's a topic that's worth discussing? Um, so I told you, I think I mentioned when I was describing Peirce's own biography that um, that he read Kant early on, right? So uh, I think he even reported that you know by the time he was in his like late teens, early twenties. He had digested like every word of uh, of Kant's critique of pure reason and had sort of thought deeply about it in every way in which one can think deeply about it. Right? He, I mean, he claimed a certain kind of like intellectual mastery of the work um, uh, at a very early age, and he subsequently wrote a paper on Peirce, and this was also a paper that he wrote very young. It was probably like in his mid twenties, I think, when he wrote this paper called um, uh, what was it called? On a new, gosh, I get on a new set of categories or something. On a new list of categories, sorry, on a new list of categories, and it's a really obscure, kind of opaque, dense philosophical paper, in which um, Peirce attempts to kind of uh, to take Kant's categories and rewrite them, <laughs> to rethink them all. Okay, so I think we mentioned this in the last conversation also. So um, the way that Kant thought about logic, right, was that um, he thought you know, one of his great innovations in the first critique of pure reason, as by, by, his, by, his, by his own acknowledgement, was to put logic before metaphysics, right? So we first think about what are the fundamental forms of judgment. That's logic. We first figure out what those fundamental forms of judgment are. These are the kind of um, these are the forms of judgment that are sort of so basic that they're constituted with the very notion of like thinking, very notion of thought. We first identify those basic forms of judgment, and then we derive our metaphysics by thinking about what is needed, okay, um, to render coherent those forms of judgment. So what's kind of implicated in those forms of judgment, right? So Kant gives a list of like what he thinks are like the basic forms of judgment, and then he gives a corresponding list of what he takes to be his like metaphysical categories. So Peirce's attitude towards Kant is this. Of course, Kant is right that this is the correct approach, right? To start with logic, right? So first write down what are the fundamental forms of logic, uh, the fundamental forms of judgment, let's say. And then we derive our metaphysics from that, right? The problem, uh, according to Peirce, is that Kant's logic was all wrong. <laughs> it was completely bogus. Like from Peirce's point of view, Kant basically like, he got his logic by reading a textbook that was like circulating at the time and just writing some things down. So m almost all of the distinctions that Kant draws are distinctions that Peirce thinks are not real fundamental distinctions in logic, right? And so Peirce, who you know had a very deep understanding of the history of logic, obviously, had a different view of what the fundamental forms of judgment are and a correspondingly different view of what the basic metaphysical categories are. And according to Peirce, um, there are really three basic forms of judgment. Um, this is triadism. This is triadism. This is triadism. There are three basic forms of judgment. They correspond roughly to um, the kind of judgment that involves, um, let's say, predication. So simple predication. Okay. Is that firstness? Um, that's firstness, right? So, um, okay. Yeah. So, so simple predication. Then the kind of judgment that puts two things in relation to one another. Okay. Um, and then another kind of judgment, which puts three things in relation to each other. <laughs> okay. Um, and that's it. Those are the only kind of basic judgments that we need to do all of logic. And so for Peirce, this was reflective of an actual technical result that he believed he had established, which is that like all that you need are one place, two place, and three place relations to do the entirety of logic. Right. And he, and he had various results, which showed that like, you can develop this system of logic based only on these three simple kinds of judgments. And, you know, he claimed completeness on behalf of that system of logic. So he's like, these are the basic three forms of judgment. Um, so what are the metaphysics? What are the metaphysical categories corresponding to them? So uh, the metaphysical categories are the categories that Peirce famously calls firstness, secondness, and thirdness in his own, like, you know, peculiar way. So what are those metaphysical categories, right? Um, so those metaphysical categories are the category. So what the category of firstness is, right, is um, 
the mode of being whereby an object exists and is what it is simply in virtue of itself and nothing else. Secondness is the mode of being in which an object is what it is in virtue of its relation to something else. And thirdness is the mode of being by which an object is what it is in virtue of its relationship to another thing through what Peirce called a third, through an interpreter. And these are three distinct, like metaphysical categories. These are three distinct modes of being. And um, Peirce believed that all three of these things, all three of these categories were sort of operative in nature. Uh, they were operative in the, in, the, in the cosmos. Yeah. And so, uh, I mean, to get back to your point about, so, so this is all a very abstract way of describing the three categories. Per said, most of what his later writings consist of are different ways of kind of elaborating this theme of, of, of the triad, right? So what do we mean by the firstness and the secondness and the thirdness that is manifest in the cosmos? So for Peirce, firstness, the thing that is what it is in virtue of itself and nothing else, corresponds roughly in, a, in sort of cosmological or even physical terms to pure chance, right? This is why Peirce calls himself a tychist. So he believes in genuine chance in the world, <laughs> right? Um, that is genuine spontaneity, right? Um, kind of something from nothing, so to speak, right? Um, that's, that's the element of chance in the world. That corresponds to Peirce's metaphysical category of firstness. Secondness for Peirce um, is something like uh, a sort of brute law-like connection between things. So it's sort of like causality, if you will, Secondness is probably the hardest thing to come to grips with for Peirce, but it's like bruteness, right? It's the part of the world that is just like the other, right? So you imagine like two things in brute contact with one another, nothing mediating between them, but two things in brute contact with one, one another. Uh, Peirce often thinks like, you know, um, like a certain conception of like a law-like association between things right? This fact is here because that fact is here. So brute causality, unmediated causality is kind of secondness in the world. Um, and thirdness is, um, what is thirdness? Thirdness is like growth, the process of something becoming something else, like through, a, through an intervening process of development if you will. And so Peirce thinks all of these things are operative in the world. There's pure chance, there's law, and there's also this other thing, which is kind of organismic growth. Um, uh, and all three of these things are present in the cosmos. And all three of these things are needed in order, ultimately, to give a satisfactory explanation of the whole of, of, of the universe. Remember, one of the things we talked about, um, I think, in our last conversation, was this issue about like, what would it mean to explain everything? What would it mean to explain the whole universe, <laughs> right? How could we possibly do that? Wouldn't it have to comprehend like itself and everything like that? So Peirce's kind of reaction to this is to say, uh, it's different than Leibniz's, but Peirce's reaction to this problem is to say, the kind of explanation that we need to give of the universe is one in which we see the universe itself, the cosmos itself as an evolving organism. It's something that is like changing and growing and developing. Um, and that's the only framework in which we can make sense of why the world is the way that it is. So for example, for example, um, uh, what about like the natural laws of the universe? How do they come to be, <laughs> right? Um, can we explain why the natural laws of the universe are what they are? Um, what kind of explanation might that look like? I mean, wouldn't such an explanation have to appeal itself to other natural laws already in place? And don't you just get some kind of like weird regress or circularity or something? So Peirce's explanation, and this is pretty radical, is to say that the laws themselves have not always been laws <laughs> in the perfected sense of the term, that the laws themselves are the product of a process of evolution where early on the laws exhibited a certain kind of chance variation, a chance variability. They didn't hold in perfection. Right? Sounds like contemporary cosmology to me. 
it's very close to it. And there are contemporary cosmologists, Lee Smolin being one of them. Yeah, um, I talked to him like, on Sunday. Perfect. He's like very deeply influenced by Peirce. I'm surprised Peirce didn't come up in that conversation. Should have. Because um, I think he is quite influenced by Peirce. But they have a very similar view on the score where it's like the laws of the universe sort of evolve. <laughs> they have become what they are, right? And um, so this is, this is part of Peirce's theory. Like when we look around at the world and we see that there are parts of the world, the physical parts of the world, what we call the physical parts of the world that are well-behaved and that are subject to laws. And then there are these other parts of the world that seem much less well-behaved, that seem much more chaotic and spontaneous, like the minds of agents that we encounter. This is not that, you know, Peirce is not a dualist, so it's not that there are two different worlds here. There's the world of law and then the, the world of mind. It's rather that what we call the world, the physical world, the world of fixed law, is just um, a, a world in which mind has evolved to the point that its habits have become really fixed. <laughs> You know, so like our minds are also evolving in that direction. Um, we're evolving in the direction of more and more fixed habits of becoming more and more predictable, becoming more and more part of the physical world. And so um, that's just part of the process of like, you know, cosmic evolution or something. So this is all, this is all part of you know, Peirce's, Peirce's cosmology. I, there, again, there are aspects of it I don't agree with, but it would be, you get into too many of the details to like to pick nets here. So. Hmm. I yeah now there if there were like a hundred things to say before there's there's a, a lot more than that now but maybe starting with some of your thoughts on the history of philosophy it beyond some of the names that you mentioned like Leibniz or Aristotle I mean even the more contemporary huge names like Quine or David Lewis or Wittgenstein they're all people who had these consistent worldviews and programs and systems and readers today, even though all three of them have passed away, you very much feel like you know them and you connect them, you connect with them and you read about them. And then your, your idea about getting your conceptual house in order, I mean, totally resonates with me. Uh, maybe. So I don't know how you feel about this, but I feel very strange referring to myself as a philosopher, and I'm not even a, a professor like you. I, I think I think of Aristotle as a philosopher, but we're I don't know what we are in contemporary times. But to the extent that I think like a philosopher, I mean I, I'm very interested in facts too, but I'm not that interested in pursuing uh, proofs in geometry but i am very interested in getting my conceptual house about the philosophy of mathematics in order and understanding truth in mathematics and, and these sorts of things but okay now getting on to to purse and his metaphysics so if can I, I say one thing can i say yes. can i make one yes. connection because i know like i there's been a lot that we've <laughs> Um, that we that we put on the table here, but so uh, one of the interesting aspects of Peirce's triadic metaphysics, this distinction into sort of the categories of first and secondness and thirdness, and, and treating these as like fundamental, it's not just that. So Peirce is somebody who believes that all three of those categories are in operation in the, in, in the cosmos. That's that's like sort of part of his distinctive triadism. But what's interesting about Peirce is he thinks that you can kind of understand the different metaphysical systems and the different perspectives on the universe that philosophers have adopted throughout the history of the subject in terms of these three categories as well. Meaning you can kind of like, you can understand a philosopher based on which of these three categories they countenance. So some philosophers will will focus on one of these three categories to the exclusion of the others tacitly not explicitly because all the categories are person's own like tech you know terminological invention but like tacitly in their philosophical writings they'll focus on one of these categories to the exclusion of the other or two of these categories to the exclusion of the other and they'll deny one of the categories from from being in operation and so he it's a kind of it's a it's a it's a beautiful way of like schematizing the history of metaphysics you can kind of organize it into different types Right, based on which of the categories play a prominent role in those respective metaphysical systems, and so, for example, uh, you know, I think one kind of e extreme example of this that that gives a lot of insight into um, this particular figure is Leibniz. We've talked about Leibniz many times. Probably, what makes Leibniz and his metaphysics so distinctive 
is that he is um, really, properly speaking, a philosopher of firstness. He really only believes. So at its fundamental level, the only thing that is, is firstness. <laughs> the only, yeah, the only kinds of objects that exist in the world are objects that are what they are in virtue of themselves and nothing else. So this kind of weird idea, right, reaches its kind of full maturation in Leibniz's monadology, where the things that really exist are these weird things that he calls monads, right? And what the monads are, are these things which are what they are independently of every other monad. So they don't, they don't touch each other. The monads don't touch, they don't scrape, they don't come into kind of like causal contact with one another. There's none of that like secondness. There's none of that interaction. Every monad is a universe unto itself and is like complete in itself. And what the universe is, is just a collection of these monads. Um, it's, it's kind of the only kinds of things that could be are things which are what they are in virtue of themselves and nothing else. Um, that's kind of the, the principle that like sort of drives a lot of Leibniz's thinking in a lot There's of different areas. Not just there. Yeah. So he has, yeah, exactly. So Leibniz has very specific views about chance, which put him much closer to purse than to a lot of other figures in, in the history of the subject. So he's very motivated by this idea. Um, it doesn't come out in explicit, in an explicit rejection of secondness or an explicit rejection of thirdness. It comes out in a kind of feeling of unease at kind of bruteness in the world. Leibniz hates the idea of there being something brute in the world. Like because just, of his religious beliefs? Maybe, uh, for whatever reason, he's like philosophically predisposed to hate that kind of brute interaction. He doesn't like it. So he philosophizes around it, <laughs> right? He's trying to build a system which doesn't, which doesn't really in any deep sense, like countenance it. Um, he doesn't like it. Um, his deep commitment to the principle of sufficient reason is an expression of yeah, this. Exactly. Right. He doesn't like there to be things which are there without an explanation. Right. The principle of sufficient reason isn't itself like a commitment to just firstness, but it is in some sense, a kind of rejection of secondness. It, it doesn't like, it's, it's like there shouldn't be things that just happen for no reason, right? That just happen as a matter of brute fact. That kind of bruteness shouldn't really be a part of the world, right? And so he, he goes out of his way to try to kind of avoid it and circumvent it, right? It, it comes out in all sorts of other subtle ways in Leibniz's thinking as well. Like he doesn't like the idea of um, what Aristotle calls like accidental truths. And we might've talked about this in the previous conversation. I don't remember, but it's like the idea that for instance, when I say something contingent, like the cup is on the table, he doesn't like the analysis of that claim that presents it as if the predicate is just accidentally in the subject being on the table, just somehow finds itself in the subject, right? For Leibniz, this is not a sufficient ground for truth because <laughs> ultimately the world can't be that way. It can't be such that one thing just finds itself in something else. It has to be that necessary. It has to be. Essential. So, so he finds a way around necessitarianism. He, so he, that kind of, that thought leads him in the direction as he himself admits of a kind of necessitarianism, mm -hmm. but then ultimately he tries to find his way around it. Um, so that all, all of it, but forgetting for the moment, like how he does that, what's important to, what, what gives you a real feel for how Leibniz thinks is like this desire to avoid putting this thing in the world, this kind of thing, right? What Peirce calls secondness, but it's this idea of like bruteness of there just being something brute, right? Something just like basic, something otherwise unaccounted for in the world. Um, Leibniz hates that. And his whole philosophy in some sense, even to the point that it reaches this like this crazy systematic view of things um, is all engineered in, in my, in my view, it's kind of all engineered to avoid having to put that element of reality into his fundamental metaphysics. Um, it's just a feeling he doesn't like it. Uh, it, so, so knowing that about Leibniz, you learn something very deep about him, right? He's the kind of person who just can't tolerate that kind of bruteness being in the world. Um, I figure like Kant much happier to accept it, <laughs> much more happy to accept it. Um, so Kant's descriptions of like sensible intuitions, there's a lot of exactly bruteness there. What I was thinking. There's a lot of bruteness there. Um, and so, you know, I, I think these categories are really like helpful for, you know, even if they don't, they only, they only have this explicit significance in Peirce's metaphysics that they're just really 
very useful devices for for trying to organize and systematize. I can see Aristotle like being very very into thirdness. Very into thirdness. So very into thirdness. In the process of being becoming. absolutely. And so the great, I think, the great philosopher of thirdness uh, was Hegel. Um, Hegel is uh, is uh, <laughs> he's basically Kant without the secondness. <laughs> Yeah, so Hegel tries to take Kant and he tries to get rid of all of this, like this noumenal stuff, all of these sensible intuitions. And he tries to give a kind of like process-based reconstruction of, of Kant. And so um, Hegel and the people who follow in Hegel's school are um, philosophers of thirdness. Here, here's another way that it manifests itself. So I'll tell you in the in, cause we've talked about logic um, on many occasions. So for Peirce, the way that the first and secondness, and, the way that first and secondness and thirdness um, relate to logic, right, is that the logical entity that exhibits firstness is the concept or the term, right? So a concept like red, let's say, is what it is just in virtue of itself, nothing else. It's not connected to any other concept. It just is what it is, right? So to the extent that it has being, its being derives entirely from its own internal coherence. If it's a coherent concept, it is in the only sense in which concepts can be. Right, that they are kind of internally coherent. Secondness, the logical entity that embodies secondness for Peirce is a proposition because it's two concepts in relation to one another. Right. So think like Frege, right? When Frege talks about a proposition, he divides it into two parts. There's the saturated part and the unsaturated part. And the proposition is this kind of like collusion between the saturated and the unsaturated part, right? But both of them like are connected in the form of the proposition. So the propositional judgment is a kind of like two part structure, if you will. It has this thing which is like saturated and this thing which is unsaturated. So when I say like the cup is on the table, the unsaturated thing is like the pre on the table, being on the table. The saturated thing is the cup. That's the thing that has reference. And I put them together and I get a proposition, <laughs> right? The cup is on the table. So for Frege, like that Phrygian concept of a proposition for Peirce is very closely tied to like secondness. Um, thirdness is like an inference. It's like when I reason that, so when I think a kind of standard syllogism, Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal, right? Here, the middle term is sort of mediating between, <laughs> um, between the other two terms, right? So in this inference, um, I have a connection between Socrates and mortality that's mediated by Socrates' manhood. So there's a kind of three, there's a, for Peirce, there's a kind of triadic structure to inference. And so inference is like the embodiment of thirdness. Okay. There are details here, but let's just, let's just, let's just go with this. Okay. So, so concepts are firstness, propositions are secondness, inferences are thirdness. You can have all sorts of different views in logic about which of these notions is basic. Right. So for instance, um, there's a whole school of, um, of thought, which is sometimes called inferentialism, right? Which subscribes to the view that the meaning of a proposition, like what it really means is just given by the system of inferences in which it belongs, right? Like what are the various things that you can infer from it? And that's how you figure out what the meaning is. The meaning is nothing other than that, right? So this is a, this is a view that's like very famously associated with like, Robert Brandom, but others have subscribed to some similar version of the view also, um, inferentialism. And so that's like a kind of thirdness view, right? That's a view that what matters is not like what gives a proposition meaning is not just the two things standing in relation to themselves, but really this whole system of thought, like how the proposition relates to other things. What kind of conclusions can you draw from it, right? What are the inferences in which you can participate and figure? That's what gives it meaning. Um, and so, um, so in this way, like sort of propositional truth is reduced to kind of inferential validity. The inferences are the basic thing. <laughs> the propositions are secondary if, you know, uh, if that, and so you can see how, like, there are these traditions in the philosophy of logic, even, which are kind of biased in Peirce's, in, 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 from Peirce's perspective, they're biased in favor of certain, you know, categories over others. One, one of these, one of these categories over others. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I I'd like to get back to how the how he 
arrived at these three categories of firstness, secondness, and thirdness. And you said that in the sort of Kantian spirit, they are implied by his logic. And he thought that uh, monadic, dyadic, and triadic predicates were uh, necessary and sufficient for uh, for for logic. But I'm I'm one thing that I'm I'm not following entirely is why tychism arises out of this, why it arises out of firstness. And I wonder if I mean this doesn't sound like it plays any role in it at all, but did he not think that f- physics should be important for whether or not there is genuine chance in the world. He thought that this could be determined from first logical principles. Yes. <laughs> I mean, he thought that um, we arrive at the categories by reflecting on what are the fundamental forms of judgment. Um, and we obtain some sense of what those fundamental forms of judgment are through a kind of a priori investigation into the world. It's a funny thing about Peirce that on the one hand, he is so steeped in science, right? Like he's steeped through and through in science. He really like has thought probably more than any other philosopher of his time about the methodology of science. And he, he elevates it in his own writings as like a really important tool. It's some sort of the great tribute of our time that we've attained this kind of like scientific to the scientific state of rationality. Um, at the same time, in his own philosophy, he is, he's oddly kind of, he's rationalistic. He's a prioristic. He's all of these things that we generally don't associate with science. Right. But I, I would say like, it's a kind of interesting fact to my mind anyway, that um, if, if you think about it, like if you think about the history of philosophy, the figures who have been most, um, like the figures who are really properly speaking, the ones who have made like real science, let's say the, the figures in the history of philosophy who made real contributions to science, almost to a man and almost to a man, they were not empiricists, right? Like we tend to associate empiricism with like science. We think that that's the natural philosophy that allies itself to science. But if you look at the history of philosophy, the picture is very different. Uh, you know, like the figures who are most, uh, most closely associated with the philosophy of empiricism, like a philosophy of mind and an epistemology that is empiricist in nature, none of them are scientists in their own, like none of them have any understanding of the practice of science. We were talking about figures like Hume, and like Mill, right? And Locke, these are the great empiricists, right? That we think of when we think of, I, I maybe, am I missing somebody? Let's, let's go with, let's go with those three. Okay. Like we've got Locke, who is a politician, never did any science, like Hobbes, who was a classicist and a kind of really bad geometer. I was, I was thinking right? that. Who thought he had like, he'd come up with all these like bogus proofs of how to square, square the circle. The circle. Yeah. Right, exactly. Like had no background in science at all. And uh, who else are we leaving at? Hume, who was really properly speaking a historian. Like that's what he was famous for. He wrote a history of England. So none of these were like scientists in any sense of the term. They were like, they were like, um, you know, men of letters, really. Right. All the advocates, the great proponents of like empiricism were all men of letters. If you look at the men of science who figure in the history of philosophy, they're almost all rationalists who subscribe in one way or another to like some a priori conception of knowledge, like Leibniz, Descartes, Peirce, <laughs> right? They were, they all had, they all had like extreme rationalistic tendencies. And so it's, it's really interesting, right? It's like, it's interesting that rationalism tends to be something it's a philosophy that often develops from the mind of like scientific people when they turn their attention to philosophy or when they, you know, when they choose to philosophize empiricism is kind of like, it's this, you know, it's, it's the, it's the philosophical product of completely unscientific thinkers. That's not to say it's wrong on account of that, but that's just to say it's very detached from the practice of science in that sense. 
And so I think casually in the mind of like, you know, the way we think about this, we tend to associate empiricism with science. Um, but Peirce obviously saw no conflict between his claims about science and his like rationalistic and a prioristic scruples. He thought they were totally in line with one another. And so, yeah. Is something you might have left out that could be very important from his, from Peirce's biography it was whether or not he was religious in any substantive way? He was. I mean, I think in a substantive way he was. He he um so there are different ways of thinking about Peirce's uh religiosity. He wrote a paper, uh kind of a paper. Uh, called a much neglected argument for the existence of God. Um, and in this paper, he basically, I mean, it, it's meant to present what he takes to be a kind of the, the sorts of considerations, which would incline one towards a belief in God. Um, the paper itself is really strange because he talks a lot about like intellectual play and the play of the mind. And it, it doesn't feel like it's anything like an argument for the existence of God. But I think if you read more closely, like it, it's a really interesting and like suggestive document. I think I think what Peirce thinks ultimately is that the way that, and again, I'm not sure that I agree with him on the score. So I'll just I'll I'll just tell you that I'm I'm reporting what I think are Peirce's views uh, and not my own. I think um, so. What Peirce thinks is that. The only philosophically respectable route to a belief in God comes by way of a sort of deep and sustained reflection on the fact that the world has a diversity of categories. There are different ways of describing the world, which um, make sense as descriptions of the world, and which in their own way present themselves to the mind as complete. So, so for example, there is a perfectly coherent way of thinking about the world as a big collection of facts, which just stand in certain relations to one another, right? It's like a big book of facts. And maybe you can read this book and you can discern some interesting connections, which will allow you to move around within it in a kind of fluent way. You know, this is kind of like a Humean picture of the world, right? Where it's just a collection of facts. They're just brute facts. And that's what the world is, right? Um, that's one way of con conceiving of the world. There's another way of conceiving of the world. So in Peirce's terminology, that's kind of a way of, of focusing on the kind of secondness of the world. There's another way of thinking about the world as, um, or of actuality, right? As something which has like come to be. It's like something that is like becoming, right? So amongst a set of possibilities, certain actualities are realized. And the world consists of the continued realization of certain actualities as against other possibilities which are left unactualized, right? It's just, if you want to think of it in like terms of like events, it's happenings or events. Right. Also a perfectly coherent way of thinking about the world. So, um, and let's just also grant that there's, there's a way of thinking about the world as a thing unto itself. This is the kind of the, the first way of thinking about the world as like something which is what it is in virtue of nothing else, just kind of something complete in itself um, and without any reference to anything out, outside of it. So there's these different ways of conceptualizing the universe for Peirce. And I think he thinks... The only way, so so when you see when when the philosopher is confronted by this kind of plurality, there are all these different ways of thinking about the world, and yet somehow they all fit together. They don't fit together by reducing one of those ways to another way. That's important, right? And the philosopher has to come to grips with the fact that there is no such reduction. Okay, um, they're all ways of describing the world. None of them are reducible to the others. And yet, in some sense, there is one cosmos that comprehends all these different ways of thinking about the world. And I think Peirce thinks 
that line of sustained reflection, like thinking hard about that is sort of the philosopher's closest approximation to like a religious belief. It, it's something that, that feels like a religious belief, but has a certain philosophical credibility to it. Yeah, and it so, kind of does. <laughs> so it's, it's this, it's, so for Peirce, the way religion enters into philosophy is through this kind of thought. It's, it's by deep reflection on the diversity of ways that the world is a, a, a kind of understanding. <laughs> and this is hard, this is hard earned an understanding that none of those ways of thinking about the world can, can, can be reduced to any of the others. So they're all in their own way, like self-standing and fundamental and kind of, um, whatever, um, irreducible uh, to the others. And then the sense that there must be something that comprehends the whole. That's the religious sentiment in the philosophy. That's, that's the, phil that's the philosopher's route to religion. Per purse, <laughs> if you will. Does, does this um, at all connect to another of his neologisms, a view that he had called cynicism? In which oh, cynicism. Cyn no, the reason, cynicism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go the ahead. reason I'll just say the reason that I would have thought that is roughly, I take it to be the idea that the universe is a continuum. And it can't be sort of blocked off into partitions. And this sort of relates, at least in my head, to this idea that there's this one governing cosmos. Yeah. No, I mean, Peirce thinks that... So when Peirce calls his philosophy synechistic, what he means is that it sees continuity as like a really essential notion for philosophers to come to grips with. Like, Peirce really thought that like, he was familiar with all the kind of mathematical developments in the theory of continuity, right? And he appreciated all of that work and he thought it was very important. You're talking um, about analysis, right? Yeah, analysis and, 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 you know, the work of like Cantor and these. So he, he was familiar with all of that work and he believed that continuity was like a really central notion to come to grips with. And that a lot of our philosophical confusions were owing to the fact that we didn't properly incorporate like continuity into our theory into our theories that, that everything was discrete everything was discretized right and that even our theories of mind needed to accommodate the idea of like continuity right that is reasoning isn't just like you have a thought and then it leads to another thought which leads to another thought right it's a continuous process of development where thoughts even once they leave consciousness let's say are still present in some like lesser way in the mind they've just sort of dispersed Peirce even has this view that like the structure of the mind is one in which like if you were to describe it, like the content properly described would have to have the structure of like a wave that like sort of disperses outwards. <laughs> so you have an idea and the idea is present for a moment and then it sort of spreads. It spreads itself out. And um, so like, yeah, continuity was a really important part of, 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 um, of Peirce's thought on this, on this point. I, you know, the point about the religious attitude and, you know, I don't know how closely that fits with, um, I mean, the continuity is an important part of the story. Also, I think you mentioned earlier what Peirce calls agapism, which is this like idea of evolutionary love. That's his way of, I think that's his way of like introducing <laughs> this. It, it's his way of like giving a name to this like religious conclusion of where his metaphysics leads him. Right. Um, then ultimately, sort of the, the picture of like how the world evolves, right? Um, is like, so uh, it's like, um, how do I put it? You know, um, the way we should think about the universe in some sense, the way that can, you know, make the most sense of all of these different ways of categorizing and, and, and thinking about the entities that exist within it is to think of it as like something that is the product of it, it itself. It is growing by itself, right? Uh, uh, it doesn't need the help of another person to grow it, but its growth is somehow um, tended to by uh, sort of, <laughs> I don't know, so, some kind of like caring presence in the universe. 
right? That the growth is directed in the way in which, for instance, we might direct the growth of a plant if we were a gardener, not by growing the plant ourselves, you know, the plant grows on its own, but sort of by clearing out the weeds, by like putting it in the environment where it can properly thrive, right? This is what the gardener contributes to the growth of the plant. And for Peirce, like we sort of have to, he thinks we have to countenance some, you know, gardener style force in the universe, which is essentially doing that, right? Which is growing the universe in that way. Um, and that's ultimately why he calls his philosophy like a philosophy of love, but, um, or agapism. But, um, yeah, so I mean, we've gone very deep on purse. We've gone very deep into purse. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, no, it's good. I mean, this is exhaustive. Uh, the, the, not exhausting, but exhaustive, but the, but the, the continuity you were describing with regard to cynicism sounded much more conceptual than the idea of physical continuity that I was imagining. Did cynicism extend to time and space? Because I was wondering if it was like useful in the sense that if Peirce adopted cynicism, then he might be able to answer puzzles or preclude solutions to ancient puzzles, like Zeno's paradoxes of motion. So if if the universe is fundamentally yeah, right? yeah, there is a there is a I mean, there's I, I know of a I know of an uh, if, if it's not an essay, it's like an excerpt from something where Peirce says this, right? He says more or less that like, you know, the solution to all of these ancient puzzles is just owing to a clarified understanding of continuity. It's kind of surprising. I mean, it's interesting, like so many people, so many people, even today, um, like still get tripped up by these regress arguments, right? Um, it's such a, it's such a difficult kind of thing to overcome. We still get tripped up by them. So you still see regress arguments all the time in philosophy, right? Um, not just in like unrespectable philosophy, but like in academic philosophy, in like real respectable philosophy, you'll see regress arguments that fail to take into account, I think, certain aspects of like um, what we now know to be the correct theory of continuity, right? Like um, it, it, there's a very tempting thought. It's a kind of fallacy of thought that people have, which is that, if every effect has a prior necessitating cause, then there must be some like first cause, right? And that this process has to continue on back to infinity or something, um, or else the process continues back in this infinite regress to infinity or something. But I mean, that's just not true. Like there's <laughs> every, suppose you know, every number, every real number in the unit interval, there's a number between that and zero, right? Which could have been its precipitating cause. You don't think that it might be true? I, I, I mean, it, if if space and time, for instance, are discrete, are discrete, that, then it might be true. And there are, there are physicists who think that it might be. So it's not totally ruled out. It's an empirical question to be settled. Yeah, I mean, even if space and time are discrete, I, I don't know how how much that affects our thinking about Zeno's paradox. I mean, this gets into other issues, but I'm not well, sure I think how much it makes that affects Zeno's paradox much more much easier to solve because then you can just deny that you can continually divide this interval between wherever Zeno is and wherever he's trying to go. Yeah. But it, um, yeah, I mean, I suppose, I suppose that is true. Yeah. You could say that, um, that there's like a, a, a plank scale kind of, uh, jump that has to happen. It does make then motion quite difficult. I mean, then you run into like the arrow. Yeah, exactly. So there's other paradoxes which 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 uh, which sort of loom large once you once there's you take the stadium that stadium like, too, which is quite. Do mm-hmm. you know that one? No. What is the the stadium paradox? Which one is yeah, that? Yeah, it's it's. I think it's called the stadium. It's it's sort of difficult to explain without visualizing, but if you imagine. Uh, space and time as being discrete, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll be, I'll totally blunder this, but we'll see how it comes out. Space and time being discrete. You have two things right here. Um, so they're, they're at a diagonal to one another. And if they're moving in, so if one's moving, here's one step 
then it's right above the, the, the first thing. Then second step, it's right here. And they've gone past each other. And at one point they were, uh, they were parallel to one another, but if they're both moving and they do this sort of flicker dance from here to here, they pass one, they like move past one another without ever being next to one another. And that seems to be paradoxical. For our audio listeners, that was totally incomprehensible. <laughs> That's okay. uh, more incomprehensible than my little diagram. But I haven't looked at this paradox for a year or two. So anyway, there, there are, the point is that there are other puzzles if space and time are discrete. Are discontinuous, yeah. No, there's all sorts of issues that come up with this continuity. I don't, I mean, I don't think Purse himself actually had that much to offer by way of like, you know interesting additions to the theory of continuity, at least as it applies to like physical theories of space and time. I just think he thought it was like a really important concept for philosophers to come to grips with. <laughs> and I, I generally think I agree with that. One, one last note on agapism is that this process of the evolution of the cosmos was agapasm. And I liked that. <laughs> was it really? Is that how he described it? Yeah. Agapasm was, the, was yeah. the process of evolution. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Peirce is like a real, he, he's very artful in his, like, in his terminology. You can read his semiotics and you just see there's just so many interesting um, uh, distinctions um, that are drawn and so many interesting uses of words. Like a lot of it is like wordplay. Um, yeah. I mean, the distinction that we, uh, so, the, you know, there's a famous, another, the last manifestation of these categories of first and second is and third is that's probably worth mentioning are these three varieties of signs that are now famous in Persis semiotics. He distinguishes between icons, indices, and symbols. And, he, you know, these are different kinds of, um, these are different modes of representation, different ways in which signs can refer to the thing signified. So an icon is like something which refers to it by resemblance, let's say. So like think of a portrait, right? Uh, if I paint a portrait of you, um, what makes it a portrait of you? right? It's like the properties of it resembling you. So this is like an icon. It manifests firstness. Um, an index is like, if you think about like an exit sign over a door, right? Um, what makes the exit sign a sign for that particular door is its physical location relative to the door. It's like placed above the door, right? Um, it's something like brute and physical about the relationship between the sign and the thing signified. And then a symbol for purse is something which um, relates to the thing signified in a much more arbitrary way. So if you think about like words in language, right? Like why is it that the word cup, that phoneme, right? Why is it that that signifies this kind of object? It's not because of any kind of like resemblance between the word and the thing, nor is it a product of any kind of like physical relationship that the two stand into one another. Except maybe in the case of like onomatopoeia, there might be a resemblance between the word and the thing signified. But in most cases of words, like there is no such resemblance. Neither is there any kind of like causal story that one can tell. It's just, um, it's like an arbitrary convention. So the third mediating thing is like the convention of language. Um, that's the thing that's like mediating between the sign and the thing signified. And so symbols are like, um, uh, are like words in a language. Um, Whereas icons and indices are other ways of like signifying things that correspond to person's categories of first and second. But I think we've belabored the triad um, to the point of exhaustion. <laughs> now, I don't know. I mean, like first makes, um, makes heavy use of it. And most, most of his later writings are preoccupied with it. But um, anyway, it's, 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 it, it's the part of his, uh, it's the part of his philosophy that people are probably um, not so familiar with. So it's, you know, it's interesting maybe to give like an introduction to the topic, although, you know, it's, it's, it's very, um, it's, it's dense and, and, and convoluted and probably can't be adequately conveyed in, in, in this kind of forum. I, what Peirce is more known for is his affiliation with like the American pragmatist movement. Um, and so, you know, I think pragmatism is something that it is like easier for people to wrap their minds around, um, and associate with Peirce than some of this, this heavier metaphysics. Um, yeah, so we, I mean, so that's actually, um, that is one aspect of Persis philosophy um, that I do in one way or another kind of subscribe to. I think if there were a word um, that really sort of, that did capture in some sense my philosophical perspective on things, it would be pragmatism. Although that's a terrible word and it's super like fraught with misunderstanding and confusion. 
I don't know, Bob. I mean, our our plan was not at all really to talk about it first. We were maybe going to talk about foundations of probability or epistemology of AI and and deep learning. None of which we got to, but uh, this was this was really. We'll exciting. have to save it for next time. We'll save it. Yeah, for next save time. it for next time. Uh, this has been a great introduction to Purse's wacky and fascinating metaphysics. So thank you so much. Thanks so much for. Uh for having having me hold on if you haven't subscribed liked commented or reviewed that would be so helpful and if you haven't yet you could also follow me on twitter and instagram at robinson Earhart. <laughs>